Women in Leadership brought to you by Heron Code, the management consultancy for what happens next. For more information, you can visit heroncode.com. Welcome back to another episode of Heron Code's Women in Leadership. And my goodness, what a ride we've had so far. Some incredible guests. And this is absolutely no different. I welcome to the podcast Najla Al Saif. How are you? And welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here and I'm doing great. Thank you. Oh, I'm so, so happy. We have so much to get through today in this episode. All right, I'll try my best. <laughs> <laughs> You've had such a phenomenal journey. You have been all over the world world you've achieved so much and yet I ha- I admire your perspective on everything and we'll definitely get to that perspective uh, a bit later on but I would like to take our listeners through a journey right now as to how how it all started you were born in Saudi Arabia is that right yes actually uh, during that time my parents were living in Yemen my dad was assigned by the government in a project there so my mom was actually pregnant in Yemen, then delivered me in Hail, where I'm from, northern Saudi. Mm-hmm. And then I went back and probably spent the first two years of my life there. Came back to Saudi for a couple of months with a brother as well, you know. Mm-hmm. And then we moved to the Philippines. So I you know I started my uh, kindergarten schooling in there. And honestly, it's such a vivid memory. It feels like it was yesterday. And it was an interesting time in the Philippines. It was during... Uh, the uh, Marcus Aquino situation when they had the revolution, you know, for me, it was just a sight. I couldn't understand. Was it a parade? What was going on? It was quite vivid. It was a beautiful, beautiful time to be in the Philippines back then. Uh, I was in the American school. Unfortunately, there was an elementary school in English. So my parents, uh, we had to come back to Saudi. And it was the only time I actually lived in Hail, where I'm from. Up north, yeah. So I was there to start my first grade, then moved to Riyadh for two years. Then from then, I moved to the U.S. until I graduated college. Wow, (laughs) you've really seen everything. You've met so many different cultures. How would you say that that's really uh, attested to who you are today? Big, big role, honestly, honestly. Uh, I always feel Philippines is a part of me. I'm partially Filipino. I, I feel that way, you know. And then everybody who was an expat in Philippines, I was able to relate to them. Uh, living in the U.S., especially in Washington, D.C., with my dad's work, and it was a very good time to be in the U.S., to be honest with you. It was a very good time in the 80s, 90s. I returned late 2000. It was a good time to be in the U.S. I also met a lot of diverse communities. You know, in, in uh, D.C., my high school, and prior to that was in a Saudi school. I met and lived with a lot of, you know, Arabs, Muslims, and other nationalities as well. But when I went to the university in D.C., I also expanded my network further. That has allowed me to become or feel more of a, a global, you know, citizen, I guess. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And tell me about your background. What was the mentality? at home when it came to education, when it came to carving your career? You know, um, the time I grew up was, I mean, right now it is quoted and it's trending in Saudi. It was a difficult time. It was a time where um, uh, it wasn't that uh, easy on women in certain levels. And, you know, the 80s were interesting. So what my dad did, because he was very supportive, very open-minded, what he did is every summer, he would take us to spend the summer in Hail. Hail is actually, or any rural city in Saudi, would be considered a bit more conservative than the main cities of Riyadh, Jeddah, or the East Coast. So what that did is really stretched us to be on both extremes, to understand and love one extreme, and then to come back and live and understand and love the other extreme, and then just find what fits you and works in the middle. Mm. and tolerate all, accept all. It has made me personally very agile, very flexible, very understanding. I can fit and adapt anywhere. Mm-hmm. I love that. And, yeah, and, and what was your focus? I mean, as you were growing up, did you have a dream, a goal that I want to be this when I'm older? You know, I want to go into politics. I want to yeah. go into what, what industry or anything in particular? That's such an amazing question. And I find myself actually talking about this point. So I'm going to surprise you and say, nope. Nothing at all. Wow. What I did, and I, and, I, and I like to share this point even with my own kids. You know, honestly, I knew that I might go back to very limited opportunities or I might go back to the sky is my limit. So what I did is I worked on my style, worked on working very hard. 
And, you know, I grew up with um, a hadith my dad always repeated, when somebody does a job, you do it really well. Mm -hmm. And when you are in an area, regardless of what it is, make sure you master it really well. So what that actually ended up doing for me is that whatever door opened in front of me, and usually many doors would open up if you are a hardworking, disciplined person and creative and always learning, I would look at the open doors and say, wait, I'm here right now. What really fits me? Because I don't want to throw myself at the most attractive door and it doesn't work out. And then, you know, younger me would have been, you know, shocked and stayed. So I actually would, whatever door opened, I, I went, to, not comfort zone. I'm not lazy. So I went with whatever fit my life at that time. And that has put me where I am today. I mean, I've had so many paths I've gone. I've had so many sectors I've worked in. I've worked in public and private in different areas, you know. Why not? It's been a great ride. No, and I'm glad you said that because we are changing on the daily uh, as exactly. individuals. I mean, exactly. you ask my husband, he'll tell you my wife changes hourly <laughs> on what Why she not? wants and the, her goals and ambitions. Yes. So it was really important. And I would say quite um, forward, forward thinking of you, especially at your age, to be thinking like that. I mean, I had to accept that mentality. All I know is I cannot control the situations around me, the options that the world offers. I mean, we saw COVID, what it did to all of us. Mm. All I know is I can control my attitude and how hard I worked. And, and I did that, and it worked well. And you had no pressure from family, from community or friends? My mother, uh, she is the eldest out of, uh, I mean, she has lots of sisters and brothers, but out of the girls, she's the eldest of eight. All her sisters are very highly educated and they all worked. My mom was the only one that decided not to finish her education. She finished it when she was a mom with us back in the U.S. So what she did to compensate, she actually pushes us to work very hard. She doesn't care what we do. Just be disciplined, work really hard, and you need to grow and develop in whatever area you're in. So we had that pressure from mom. Uh, dad is a workaholic, so we all became workaholics just like him. But having that one goal... When it comes to career, it's not necessary. It's good. It's good if you know what you like, if you know what your inspiration is. But if you don't know, that's an opportunity in itself. And I try to tell my kids that as well, you know. Yeah, because I feel like people even at an older age, at 40, 50 years old, I mean, COVID was a great example. People were having, I guess, a professional crisis as to who am I? Is this even what I want to do? Exactly. And it, ha it can happen at any age, right? Yeah. In Saudi, actually, I know in the U.S., they're calling it the Great Resignation. In Saudi, they're actually calling it the Great Reshuffle. Why is that? It's because recently, after the Vision 2030 programs and all the new policy updates and changes, new industries are available in Saudi that weren't available. You know, ladies who used to work in, as teachers or in banking, they realized that they want to go into entertainment, into culture, into tourism, into the arts, into music. That wasn't available. So in, in Saudi, people are rediscovering themselves, and we have the great reshuffle right now. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, Their do. own version. <laughs> yes, yes. I have to ask you, you said there were, there were less opportunities for women in the late 90s. Yeah, that's true. Internally, within the community, within, you know, I guess, women speaking to women... What was their view on that? Was it just acceptance of that? Or was there, okay, well, in order to carve something for myself, I'm going to have to move? I'm going to speak on my behalf, okay? Yeah. And then about the community that around me. I might not represent everybody in Saudi, but I represent my community. One thing I think that distinguishes Saudis overall is that, and, and, and it has really helped us, by the way, in the way we handled the COVID situation, is that we are very trusting of our leadership. And we are very comfortable. And we look at our parameters and work as best as we can within these parameters. We don't become negative. We don't, you know, uh, complain too much. This is what I got. How can I make the best out of it? And at the same time, enjoy my life, you know, and maximize whatever opportunities I can get. Now, going back to your question, I did have very limited options. Um, women didn't mind. I mean, the competition was quite high. But at the same time, opportunities were very available back then in these sectors. So now these sectors are actually limited, but there's unlimited opportunities now, mm. which is much better. Mm, good. So everyone's happy, of I course, guess. Of course. Of course. Yes. So I want to take you to Washington, D.C., right. where <laughs> you did your internship. But tell us oh, more about okay. exactly what you did okay, there. Okay. So again, uh, in college, I started off undecided. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know what I wanted to do. But growing up in high school, everybody used to come and complain to me about their problems. Overall, you know, personal uh, family, and even with friends in school. 
And for some odd reason, I, I was maybe, you know, good at giving some advice. You know, I was the eldest out of my siblings, the eldest grandchild out of a lot, you know. So I've had a little experience in that area. And I guess I was a good listener. So everybody kept on nudging me in the direction of not just study psychology. It's the right thing to do. And then studying psychology, I had a few options in my internship, and I decided to do something that was unique, which was working with people with learning disabilities. I was very, very, very lucky to be accepted in the lab school of Washington for internship. Everybody there was doing their PhDs, to be honest with you. I was the only undergrad. I was lucky because Mrs. Sally Smith, may she rest in peace, was the head of that school, and I think she was the owner as well. And she had a very close relationship with the Saudi embassy, and she really wanted this region to grow in that area. So I got an internship there, and it was such a beautiful, beautiful experience there. It was very diverse. I got, I've always loved people with disabilities. For some reason, I had a weakness for them, especially cute people with Down syndrome. They're adorable. Um, and when I did that internship, you know, it was so interesting because after I got that experience, I learned even harder work ethics. I learned that when you work, especially with children, you really need to just love them. You must love all kids. And I loved it. And I saw in that place one of the most diverse, beautiful love expressions. I remember one time there was a Pakistani girl, young girl wearing a hijab, and her TA, the teacher that was responsible of her, was um, a Jewish guy wearing a yarmulke. And he loved her so much, and she loved him. And you know, within those you know, walls, it was just love for the kids and pushing them forward. And that itself was a global universal message for me as well. Mm -hmm. Ironically, <laughs> after I graduated and I came back to Saudi and I started my personal life and I had my first child, my eldest ended up being autistic. So my son has autism. My son Khalid, who's now 20 years old, is autistic on a low functioning scale, you know, so he's quite autistic. And I always thank God that I had that experience. Imagine if I didn't. It would have been very difficult, especially at the time he was diagnosed. Awareness wasn't enough globally, to be honest with you. And um, I knew how to diagnose him myself, even though I took him to a couple of centers in the region, uh, some tests in Rome, because my family were living in Rome during that time. I just knew to go back to the DSM-4 back then. Now it's a DSM-5, you know, the diagnostics book. And I diagnosed my son, and it was confirmed by the medical experts. And thank God, that experience really prepped me to being a mom for Khalid. Not, not good enough. I'm, I'm still trying. <laughs> But that was a that was a good experience, to be honest. That's yeah. a prime example of everything happens yeah, for a reason, definitely. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so was that a testing time for you then? I mean, you had this oh. experience in the lab, but also as a mother, it's a whole different experience. Yes. Um, look, as a mom, I, I still feel that way about all my kids, to be honest with you. We always want to provide the best for them. You want to make sure that, you know, especially as a working mom, a career mom who travels and does all that stuff, you wonder sometimes if you're doing the right thing. And it's it multiplied that by 10 for somebody who has autism and really is not verbal. You just wonder how is he feeling, how is he thinking, and is he happy? We sh usually he, he does express happiness. But um, during that time, honestly, m I think my biggest flaw, and this is where I actually try to, I, I, it's very hard for me to pick up calls, by the way, but unless somebody says I'm a parent of an autistic person. I pick it up automatically. So that is something I was always available for. At least if I don't have the right inf updated information, because my son is older now, what I can do is just tell them, just relax. I wish somebody told me just to relax. I actually ran into an article earlier on after he turned seven, eight, because I was trying to cure the guy. I wanted him cured. I wanted him, you know, in, in, uh, in the university. I wanted him to read and learn how to write and et cetera. And, and then I read an article over Facebook, you know, that talked about parenting overall, not just people with disabilities, but sometimes, you know, let things slide. Let, just enjoy them as long as they're healthy and happy. Okay, don't give up on them, <laughs> but let things slide. It really changed my attitude with Khalid because during that time, uh, I think I drove him crazy. I put him on all these weird diets, all these weird supplements. He was getting behavioral modification sessions. I mean, somebody would leave the house and I would go rush him into a center. And I, I made him really sad. I was just pressuring the poor kid back then. 
And then that article just made me step back, reassess the situation. And then, you know, he's been the happiest person I know since then, I hope, you know. Oh, I'm sure, I'm yeah. sure. And that's the thing about parenting. There's no guidebook. There's no right or wrong. No one can prepare you for it. Exactly. Uh, they do say about parenting, you know, parents forget that they're not you. Yeah. Your child is not you. Exactly. They're just, uh, just a fragment of you. So let them live and let them be. So letting I go, agree. I guess, was very essential in that story. Yeah, yeah, until now, I remind myself, even with my other kids, naturally, just let things slide, you know. Mm. It's okay. Yes, motivate them, open doors for them, inspire them, prep them. It's a competitive world now, especially in Saudi. They need to be ready. We're opening up to the globe. Mm -hmm. It's a competitive market. But still, step away and let them choose their own path. And so you were still working whilst you were building your family? Yes. I took two years off when I had my daughter, Hela. My daughter now is 17. When I had her, I actually gave birth to her as a preemie in my sixth month. So her survival rate was quite low. And it was actually at the same time that I got a confirmed diagnosis of Khaled being autistic. He was almost three. I knew that I had to drop everything then. Uh, be home. And I honestly, honestly, I always advise any new mom, regardless of the situation, if you can financially afford to take off, your career won't be hurt. Take off, spend the first year or two with a child, and then go back to your career energized, put the kid in daycare and, and be more focused. So I took two years off. That was good until I learned how to handle Khalid's situation, set him up in the right centers. Hala was up and running and all healthy and cute and put her in a daycare. And then I was lucky because I exited the education world and I discovered my new career path, which took me into the corporate world. It was Sagia. And honestly, when I went in, I didn't even know what they were doing. I didn't know. They, they offered me two jobs. And one of them was in HR. I'm like, what does HR mean? <laughs> Seriously. Wow. And now one of my roles is CHRO. So you were learning on the job? I, I, like I tell you, I learn really hard and I work really hard. Wow, that's a phenomenal skill that not a lot of people have. I, you know, I, I have to confess, maybe because I did have a little pain with the situation at home, I buried my pain with a lot of work. Mm. It helps. You know, talking just made everybody around me sad. So I real, venting didn't work. So I said, just work hard, keep your mind busy. And it did help. So you went from like essentially grassroots uh, society, community environments, um, which are the beautiful stories that you told us of the people that you met along the way to a corporate world. Yes. What yes, was that yes. change for you on a personal level? How was that? Well, um, lots of work, lots of hours. Um, I know a lot of women are not going to like hearing what I have to say, but to be honest with you, um, I really didn't face any resistance as a lady. Uh, if any resistance I faced was, uh, did I deserve the opportunity? And then with a lot of hard work, and when you do earn the right respect, they back off. And I started off, by the way, in Sagia as a coordinator, which was like another word for a secretary. And then within a few years, I was a director. I left Sagia as a director of organizational development. And I remember my first question during that interview was, as a lady, is there a glass ceiling? And then the guy told me, the sky is your limit, as long as you really prove yourself and work hard. And he was honest. He was right. The sky was my limit. Mm. Yeah. And, and it was a good opportunity. It was a green field for me to actually learn on the job, you know, explore, make mistakes, and then grow. Mm, absolutely. And the psychology degree, did that come in handy with Definitely. working in the corporate Definitely. world? Definitely. You know, also the two years I took off, I think I ate up all the psychology books that I can get my hands on, watched every Oprah Winfrey show, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Phil, you know, went through the net, you know, so I had some time. I worked on myself. So you yourself didn't experience any bias as a woman in the workplace at all? Actually, the only bias I'm hearing is now is because women have you know, the upper hand on prior, uh, on opportunities, and they're a priority now, I'm beginning to hear, oh, well, because she's a lady, she got that opportunity. Now I'm beginning to hear that. But uh, I admit, you know, maybe there were limited opportunities. Not for me, I'll be honest. When I just tapped the right channels, I found the right opportunities. I just have to search really well. Um, I honestly, no, I managed men, I managed ladies, and it was never an issue. And then, and then after that opportunity, I actually moved into a job for less than a year. It was called the Women Empowerment Program, Women Employment Program. It was actually during that time reporting directly to the late King Abdullah. 
So I actually had to work on women empowerment issues, employment, incentive programs. So I've seen it offhand. I remember the only observation I had, and I, and, I, and I heard it from one lady complaining from another lady. And one was like, you know what, I really don't want to work with a lady. They're just harder. I'm like, wait, stop right there. Mm-hmm. I understand you have your own issues, but have you ever heard a man saying, I don't want to work with a man? They're like, no. I'm like, okay, so you have an issue with a character, with a behavior. Say, I don't want to work with somebody who's firm or somebody who's rude or somebody who's demanding. Talk about the character itself. Don't talk about the gender, you know? So I think that's a line I echoed a lot during that time. Yeah. No, that's so interesting that you say that because that just changed my perspective yeah, completely. Exactly. It's, yeah. In the yeah. media industry, it's very uh, rare to come across uh, females. Exactly. Uh, you know, it's and a male dominant I- industry. Yes. And so when I came across a female that I didn't quite, you know, yes. gel with, you yes. think it's because yes. she's a woman. And exactly. you're so right. It's not. A man not. can have the same mentality exactly. and I won't point it out. Um, and I dare you to hear any man saying, I don't want to work with a man. Oh, absolutely. You're not going to hear it. So Never. why should we say it? Oh, exactly. <laughs> no, here, here. I completely agree. <laughs> yes. And because you come across as an incredibly um, soft individual in a in, in a beautiful way, a- and someone who is empathetic, someone who is caring, and that that is uh, definitely you know something that has been proven in your in your career thus far. So in that corporate world, was it? Did you have to shy away from that side of you? Not at all. I'm very keen on being a lady, so I don't have to be a man to succeed in a man's world, and it's not a man's world anymore right now. You know. Um, I'm very, I've been told, tone down your makeup. I'm like, why? They're like, no, you so you can mesh better. I'm like, no, thanks. Wow. Yes, I've been, you know, I've, one thing I actually did face difficulty with, not difficulty, it was emotionally hard on me, is when I had to fire people. And I hate doing that, you know, as somebody who's empathetic and worries about the people set up in their lives. But again, if once you've given opportunities, once you've done the right thing, gone through the process, sometimes the right thing to do is just to exit people. Here, I have to admit, I'm still a bit weak. Mm, yeah, that's a difficult part. Yeah, I hate that part, but gotta do it. Mm-hmm, you do. And uh, w- what was the work-life balance for you? Because being a, uh, being a mother and then working those corporate yes. hours, yes, yes. how did you really get through that? Such a generic answer, but it's the truth. I believe in work-life uh, mesh. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's not really balanced. It's just I'm working all the time and I'm living my family life all the time. So uh, just downstairs, I was sending an email before coming up here, you know. Um, I literally work all the time and I don't mind. It eases my pressure when I'm in the office. So when I'm in the office, at least I spend more time with the people. I get to attend more meetings, lots of meetings. Um, we do a lot of innovation and thinking. So why? Because I've already cleared my list. My inbox, I can get uh, over 100 emails a day. I mean, one time in an hour, I got 60 emails. Oh, my gosh. They're always cleared. Mm-hmm. I don't have any unopened or unread emails. Mm-hmm. Okay, something that needs to be actioned, I will put it somewhere. I find that works well with me. I did have to sacrifice part of my social life. I did have to excuse myself from a lot of weddings and parties in Saudi. First of all, I, I, I mean, it's so time-consuming. And that time, I'd rather spend it either enjoying my personal time with my family, with my parents, or just, you know, watching movies and shows or working. To be honest, Mm. I prefer to work. And how important is it, though? Uh, Because I feel like our careers, not just as women, I'm talking about men, as humans, our careers become us. They become our everything. They become our identity. It's so beautiful to me that you you have the mesh mentality because a lot of people just get stuck in the work and yeah. that becomes their be all and end all. Yes, yes, yes. And you know, for a lot of people who lost their jobs during COVID yes, and yes. stuff like that, they were like, "Who am I now yeah. without my job?" Exactly. Um, how do you how can you give any tips on how to kind of create that difference? I agree, especially during the COVID, people had to question themselves a lot. Who am I without my career? Who am I now? I don't like who I am. Um, Honestly, um, we see a lot of SME owners. They're role models when it comes to that. You know, all these entrepreneurs. What they do is they do something they love. Okay, not all of us have the luxury of being an entrepreneur. But if you look at them and study their model, they actually love what they do, and they don't mind doing it 24-7, and at the same time starting their family or hanging out with their friends and doing their hobbies and their explorations and enjoying life while they're doing what they love. Honest to God, I really love my job. 
I love what I do. Mm -hmm. I, I do love a lot of the corporate initiatives that we have, especially things that are linked to social enablement and women empowerment, people with disabilities. Um, just tr make sure you love what you do, you mm -hmm. know? And, and if you don't love what you do, don't exit. I'm against anybody who tells you exit. The exit to do what? <laughs> to be home and can't pay the bills? Mm -hmm. No, find an alternative tap your foot into it slowly. And if you like it, then slowly transition into the other career that you do love and you can have an honest earning. Because mm, people always think it's one extreme or the yeah. other. Just take your time yeah, with it so time. you know that take what you're time. doing is yeah. right. And it's so interesting because everything that you're doing right now, it's such a full circle moment to where you started your journey, being international, you know, working yeah. around the world. Yeah. Do you ever stop to acknowledge how far you've come? Um, no, I, I, I don't have time. To <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, there's still got a long way to go. Mm. There's still a lot that needs to be done. You know, there's a lot of contributions. One thing, if you allow me to talk about as well is, especially with women, is we've also signed up with an NGO in Saudi for orphans. And in Saudi, orphans are not, you know, individuals who lost their parents. These are abandoned kids at birth. So they don't even know who their families are. They were adopted by the government and sponsored by the government. So they are, they come from a different emotional setup, you know, and they do need extra effort and attention when it comes to enablement. So when we signed with one of the NGOs in Saudi, we've actually also hired lots of women through them. And we've actually created a new unique job for them that wasn't available in our industry under our companies, which is female promoters in the poultry industry. And that has been a wonderful journey. There have been some tough moments. You know, for example, when the managers come to complain to me about, you know, how do we handle the situation? How do we do this? I always remind them, remember, these are individuals who never had parents to coach them, mm -hmm. who never had family to talk them through. And you know, our Eastern culture, family is everything. Your social lingering, a lot of your mental intelligence, your emotional, it comes from family and the society. These individuals didn't have that growing up. Mm. So I have to remind uh, my colleagues. And I also collaborate closely with the NGO. I bring them in and say, hey, guys, you're the NGO. I'm the business. If they're not delivering, I'm firing. Which mm -hmm. you know, hurts to say, but <laughs> you should provide with the support. I know the government is funding this. So one thing mm. they've done, which was beautiful, is they got them life coaches. Oh, amazing. And mentorship programs. So I'm glad the NGO is also very responsive. And so we're working as a team. Another thing that I'm really excited about, one of our sub companies, or we recently, um, uh, we sponsor is uh, Popeyes. So we're reintroducing Popeyes in the region again, you know. And uh, alhamdulillah, my colleagues in Popeyes are working on the Muwa'ama certification. So what is that? So to ensure before you hire people with disabilities, all disabilities, you need to make sure, you know, engineering wise and or the space itself is set up for people with disabilities, all. So if a person is blind, cannot hear or physically disabled or mentally, how fit is the place? Muwa'ama means how fitting is it? So it's a certificate. So alhamdulillah, we're trying to get Muwa'ama certifications from Popeyes. And hopefully we will introduce a large number of uh, Saudi colleagues who are disabled. With, yeah, with disabilities. See, yes. this is amazing that essentially what you're doing is pushing private companies to yes. change their ethos completely. Yes. And you're, you're having to do that from, from the ground up, right? Yes. Because yes. that's, that's essentially trying to change the whole, I guess, a nucleus yes. of something yes. that has been existing yes. for so long. How has that been? Has there been a lot of uh, challenges along the way? To be honest with you, what I've found, and, and it's very rewarding, especially as a parent with somebody with a child with disabilities, is that everybody wants to do it, but they're scared. Mm. They think they don't know how to do the right thing. They don't know what the regulations are. They don't know if they're set up well. So when a person like me comes and reassures and encourages, and sometimes, by the way, I'm not pushing as far as I should, because I do see where there are gaps and we need to take it easy, you know, until we fix these gaps. But with a little bit of encouragement and just standing behind them, I found that my colleagues are, they want to jump on it. They are excited. They, they're passionate. They all have that soft touch, you know. And, and especially our CEO, I mean, the guy went all the way to this um, center that we like to work with called SAI for um, training and employing people with disabilities in all the private sector. 
And he actually went himself and got the tour and hung out with all the kids. And he loved the people there. And he's so, and he's always pushing me. He's like, Najla, where are the people from Sa'i? I'm like, they're on their way. They're on their way. <laughs> so it's, it's great to have that. And then also his excellency is very passionate about this. This is amazing. I love to hear that these changes are being implemented and it gives us uh, hope for the future, yes, uh, yes. which leads me on to my last question, yes. is what is your hope for the future? What does what your ideal oh. world look like for your industry and generally humankind, I guess? Wow. Gosh, that's a big question. It's, it's a loaded <laughs> question. You know, what's interesting is if you asked me that question a month ago, my answer would have been different, okay? Mm. Looking at the current global environment and, you know, what's happening on a crisis level when it comes to the food industry, uh, the energy industry, I really, really, really wish, you know, especially when we look at people who are either with disabled or orphans or women from rural areas, is that during these turbulent times globally that we don't forget people socially who need us the most. I mean, it's hard to look, you know, to take care of everybody, but it's not not forget those who are weak and the elderly as well, you know. I mean, I know in our Eastern societies, we're actually really good with the elderly, but globally as humankind, I don't think we're as good as we should be. Um, You know, again, if I can go back to my previous point, just work really hard, work hard, enjoy what you do, love everybody around you. To me, the ideal success is to be balanced, by the way. I've gotten lots of approaches for more senior roles, and I've declined because it would have really messed up the balance in my life. I don't mind working all the time, but I need to feel balanced, you know. Mm-hmm. And being balanced is, is, is amazing. You just have to define it well. Mm-hmm. Well, that is a beautiful note to end on. Thank you. You are wonderful. You have such Thank a beautiful you. heart. And with Thank everything you so that you're much. doing, uh, you. we're just so, so happy that you are doing. Because we need more people like you uh, in the world. Thank you. Thank you. So thank I would you. like to thank you for being My with pleasure. us here today. And uh, safe flight, because you're flying out, aren't you? Yes, <laughs> again tomorrow, yes. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you so, you so much. much. I'm really honored, and I appreciate the opportunity. And I look forward to seeing you more often. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Women in Leadership brought to you by Heron Code, the management consultancy for what happens next. For more information, you can visit heroncode.com.